Okay, well, good morning, everybody, and uh, welcome to day two of the Creative Summit. You'll have to excuse my notes. I'm, my head's somewhere between Middle Earth and outer space at the moment with everything <laughs> going on. But uh, I hope you've woken up and had your coffee and are ready for another great day of, of 3D. Now, over the past few years, the UK studios uh, have held host uh, to, the, to the production of a number of really high-profile native 3D projects from Prometheus, the Hugo, uh, Jack the Giant Slayer, 47 Ronin, and, and right at the moment, uh, Exodus, which is just wrapped, actually. And, of course, on the post-production side, we've had uh, films uh, currently going through Maleficent, uh, Edge of Tomorrow, Jupiter Ascending, and, of course, the winner of the Best British Film, BAFTA, Gravity, uh, as well. And on, and on the TV front, Sky 3D still leads the world um, as uh, the sort of top 3D TV channel and sort of uh, is, is, is one of the few channels at the moment that's sort of really up there. So what I wanted to do today, I'm really happy to be, to be joined by the Chief Executive of Film London and the British Film Commission, Adrian Wooten, and uh, Creative Skill Sets uh, Head of Film, is that the president? Head of Film, uh, Dan Simmons. And we're just going to have a bit of a conversation about the, about the UK's position in the global 3D conversation. And then sort of branching into... In, in conjunction with these larger sort of Hollywood films that are shooting here, what that means for the UK industry and for, for UK filmmakers and how that sort of uh, is positioned when it, when it sort of comes to that. So firstly, I guess, this is a bit, a, a bit of a broad question, I guess, but is there anything to be taken away by the number of 3D films that are shot over here? Um, and then thinking about sort of Sky 3D and also sort of looking uh, yesterday and, and, and hopefully today as well of sort of an enthusiastic response to 3D here at the Creative Summit. Is there anything to be taken away by that? Is there an argument to be so that the UK has a love of 3D, do we think? Or is it just... Um, <laughs> I, would, I'd say we, I don't know, it's you know. I think we seem to be um, showing that we can deal with the, the, uh, the activity over here. Yeah. So I think we, you know, we're, we're guarded and sort of... Um, uh, People, we, we about three, four years ago, we did um, a survey of uh, sort of um, executives and sort of uh, Hollywood uh, sort of studio execs, um, asking about their confidence in the UK skills base. And actually, mm -hmm. there's a real sort of strong um, sense that we had some of the best skills in the world. I mean, broadly, you know, obviously our skills base is regarded, regarded exceptionally highly, and there was a very strong sort of confidence in our sort of ability to deal with 3D production. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a sort of slight concern that as that grows over the coming period, will we be able to sustain that? And that's why we've been working to sort of try and model projections in terms of activity that may be coming and making sure that we keep upskilling the, the sort of the workforce. Um, but at the moment, yeah, I think that we have a strong ability to, to deal with that. We've got a good track record. The films that are coming out of the UK mm. have obviously gone on to sort of achieve great critical success and commercial success. So, yeah, we seem to be doing great. well. Yeah. No, and I, I mean, I'll absolutely echo what um, Dan said. I think that in terms of 3D, the, um, apart from you know, the consumer response, um, I think the fact is, is that if you look at the 3D as a as an exciting, potentially dynamic component within the whole, in a sense, technological mix that we can offer, that uh, extraordinary visual effects, post-production, um, critical mass we have uh, in the UK and in, in this city, um, I think that you know, 3D um, developments here have benefited from the fact that there's been such an emphasis on, on growing the skills base, but also the, the, the investment it's been feasible, really, developing over the last 10 years and accelerating in R&D, in terms of new technology, yeah. and the growth of, you know, if you think about what, in a sense, the pre-Harry Potter and post-Harry Potter, and, and, you know, triggered, <coughs> or heavily triggered, not by the investment of Warner Brothers, but also because of what happened, really, post-2007 and the tax credit, mm. and now, obviously, with, with the new tax credits introduced for television and animation, which are equally having a kind of amazing kind of stimulative effect and the fact that we've got another modification coming in next month mm -hmm. which is going to we hope further drive particularly business um, which isn't necessarily um, automatically shot here mm -hmm. um, but can take advantage of the tax relief and and certainly bring packages of work for visual effects and and, and hopefully 3d as as an element of that, yeah. uh, I, th I think that we have a kind of, you know, we've got a very much an upward curve. You know, there's a huge amount of business coming in, and one of the reasons that business is coming in is because it wants to take advantage of the skills base. Mm. It wants to take advantage of the the R and D, the extraordinary technological base, and the the way in which different companies in the, in in the UK and London focused are. Um, are really kind of pushing 
barriers and because of the infrastructure, because of the studio infrastructure as well. So I think there's a, com you know, relates to the tax relief, there's a whole package of things. It's, it's, I wouldn't like to describe it as a perfect storm, but it is certainly, as I said, a critical mass of activity that's going on. And I think 3D is a, clearly a, a very important component of that. And probably, m maybe now, is going to become a more important component because I think that gravity and you know and there's obviously been so much kind of noise about it but um, but it looks to me like a game changer it looks to me like it's changed you know it is reset <coughs> the doll and everyone's gone we thought that about 3d mm -hmm. oh actually that's doing something you know that really is kind of sure. you know having an impact on people the, 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 in a sense the the filmmakers and the and and the companies but it's had a massive impact on the consumer. I think, I think, personally, I think there was a minute where you thought, hang on, are people getting bored with this? Are mm -hmm. they, you know, are they kind of thinking, well, so what? Yeah. And, all, and gravity's just sort of wiped that clean, and everyone's going, well, if we're going to see 3D of that kind of quality, yeah. then actually we're not bored with it. Do you think that's an aspirational thing now? Like, now that something like gravity is out there, that that's now become a benchmark that people will, will aspire to? Because, I mean... <laughs> For me, this is the success story of Gravity, as much as it is obviously in the, in the conception of the idea with Alfonso and the execution at that level, but was uh, especially down to, in many ways, the departments all interconnecting and being on the same sort of page. And that being that, you know, and, and, and beyond the visual effects as well, which is obviously a huge, huge component, but how sound obviously incorporated and costume design and the conversation beginning at its earliest stage. So a decision was made very early on to make this a 3D film of the highest quality, and therefore every department along the line from set construction to sound design, to performance and the editing and all that feeling that the that combined aspect of it um, is the, is the real success story in that in that project. I don't want to doubt things, but I, 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 th I mean, for me, that's the, in a sense, that's the gauntlet's been thrown down. That's the challenge. Right. Mm. It's all, I mean, it's a huge opportunity. The question is whether, you know, the, the you can replicate. I mean, obviously, there was a lot of money expended. Yeah. Uh, you have a very, very, you have a brilliant producer. You have a single, <coughs> really single-minded director. Mm -hmm. An extraordinarily brilliant, you know, creative. T you know, the, the, the Tim Weber and Daniel yeah. Dentist, Chris Burt, every, yeah. all the people involved in that yes. were are extraordinarily creative. And there was that kind of sense in which it seems to me that they that everyone went we're going to do this we're going to follow alfonso's vision we're going to work together and the question is is whether how replicable it is yes. how 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 that kind of environment can be sustained and also it, on a budgetary level and i and i don't know this is can you scale that down mm -hmm. as well yeah. you know can, can it be i'd love to think it could yes because I think the, the thing that, that, and this is maybe a provocative thing to say, but I think we're all aware that, you know, last year was, was particularly the case, that there were a bunch of 3D films that you looked at last year that were made by huge studios, some of which were made here, mm. which were, there was nothing wrong with them as, as movies, but you kind of looked at the 3D and thought, well, you know, take it on, take it off. Yeah. Does it really make any difference? Mm. Are, there, I mean, are there two cultures that are coming in 3D films where you have the awards films and the, with the Hugos and the Life of Pies and the, obviously Gravity where they become very much a creative vision of a director and then you have the purely commercial decisions and yesterday we heard Charlotte Jones talk about in particular some territories where films, I mean Noah being an example where uh, say the UK and America and English speaking territories are receiving the 2D version as required and then late Last year, the decision was made in a very short sort of production period to cert for certain territories um, for it to be released in 3D, and that's obviously that's a very different thing from a four-year conception of a of a film like Gravity, where it's being heavily led by a director, through to it being a, a purely commercial decision. Do you think that's kind of what's happening in the market, and and that is is possibly how we're getting this sort of level of dissatisfaction with the audience, where they're sort of now with the gloss of, of Avatar mm. long faded now, we're not being sort of blown away by the shock and awe of it. We now have a, a taste for what, what does work and now we're becoming much more selective of where we spend our, our money. Yes, I mean, the, the Pixar guy yesterday morning, you know, yeah. sort of actually sort of saying, you know, the Sony people, I think, uh, got switched off 3D by just seeing some some sort of uh, late some films that were, as you say, sort of decided quite late on to sort of post convert sure. or whatever. Sure. And sort of, you know, if it's not conceived that way, then you can post convert and not have everything to make it as strong a proposition as you'd other have, otherwise have. And um, so yeah, I think you know, and, um, again, <coughs> hearing um, 
Jean Pierre Genet, sort of again, you're sort of saying, right. you know, looking back at his career and thinking actually he could have conceived all of his films yes. in 3D. You know, yeah. Pixar saying the same. You know, but it's about waiting for the technology and the right project. Um, so yeah, absolutely. I think you know that you know I think Life of Pi was such a big sort of game changer as well, sort of in terms of people really sort of seeing the narrative depth and the emotional depth mm -hmm. that that could bring. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I think. Uh, now it's there's and suddenly where it becomes a very commercial proposition and sort of not a creatively driven sort of decision then i think unfortunately there is going to always be that divide and that will always happen and it might end up with audiences sort of seeing through that and not sort of feeling very satisfied but i think as long as there are propositions that actually do deliver against their potential mm. and sort of come through then i think there'll always be an audience for um for those films that do sort of bring that that emotional punch no i think i think dan's absolutely right and i think also you know, with with the films that we know that have, uh, and, and not and not to be snobbish, but the films that we know that have been actually really good, mm. it's because the filmmakers have been really good. You know, and the filmmakers have thought, you know, <coughs> we all know Monica Scorsese is an extraordinarily painstaking director. So is Ang Lee. Yeah. So is Alfonso Cuarón. Yeah. They they really they're not prepared to just have sort of you know, well we're going to have some special effects trial done because sure. the studio thinks it's it's good for an extra 10% of the box office and we can, and the exhibitors are all going great because, you know, we can put that onto the ticket revenue. So, so, right. and, I, and, and also I'd say, you know, the, and this is the other opportunity and stroke challenge, is that the, the scalability is that when you, you know, Jean-Pierre Genet or, you know, what Vim Vendors did, which was relatively, I mean, very few people in reality, yeah. or the global audience, saw his movie about the dance of innovation. But it was extraordinary, yes. and again, it showed you what you could do with a much, much, much lower budgeted film. But because Vin Vendors is a really extraordinarily talented director, and had a conception, this was 3D, this mm. really was a 3D concept, to, to show the extraordinary power of a particular, of dance, mm. you know. Um, then again, I, I think that's a kind of signpost, that you can imagine other filmmakers going, actually, I really want to do this, um, because it it really will work if I conceptualise it from the beginning. Well, this is the thing about Vim, really. I mean, it, uh, at midday today, we have uh, a talk about his Cathedrals of Culture project, yeah. which was shown at the Berlin Arla, and he's just wrapped his next film, which is, from all reports, a straight drama shot in Montreal with James Franco. It's very different to what would be considered a 3D-centric yeah. type story, but he's sort of finding a way of doing it. Do you think, then, it's just a matter of time, or it'll reach a critical mass over a period of time where enough directors have that kind of confidence after seeing a few of these films come through and realise that. Are we just going through an early teething period where you're at two levels, you have a commercial pressure and the, the real directors or the, the real directors on mass haven't had an opportunity yet to play with the tool set? Yes. Yeah, I think yeah. as the cost of production come down, I think, you know, sure. as we were sort of hearing yesterday in here, but sort of um, glasses free, yeah. sort of TV, etc. I yeah. think the minute that's, that would be such a game changer. The sure. minute it's sort of, you know, people can consume 3D in the home much more sort of sure. easily, uh, comfortably, uh, that will massively change the sort of the mm. demand. Um, and I think that will sort of see through the pipeline, basically. Cool. I, I think Dan's right. I think that certainly the glasses, for, you know, because, you know, there's all kinds of things. You know, people don't like wearing glasses. People don't. You know, people wear glasses have to wear the glasses on yeah. top of the glasses. All of that stuff, which is an encumbrance to your viewing experience. Yeah. If you sweep that out, all of a sudden that changes everything because everyone goes, "Well, it's great. It's in 3D, and I don't have to. Yeah. I don't have to think about the glasses. I'm not also." You know, when I don't have to keep buying the glasses, you know, from you know, mm. etc. At every yeah. time you go and adding adding that all on, mm. um, b but I also think that it's at events and summits like this that it, it helps to push the kind of awareness because I think the thing is that it isn't just a question of, of of leaving it to the kind of the market. I think the market will help with that pressure, and more technological developments within the market will help. But I think that filmmakers have got to be encouraged mm. to, to not look at it as a, you know, as a gimmick, but to think there is something I can do. I mean, certainly our responsibility is, is, is definitely to promote the opportunities mm. as part of that whole wonderful package of facilities and resource and creative talent we have yeah. here in the UK. And obviously we regard that as a, as a very important part. But, but you need those case study examples just in the same way as we're doing now. We're, we're now telling people about, you know, I mean, nine months ago, less than nine months ago, people were saying to us, well, do you really think the tax credits and animation are going to work because, you know, nobody's shot any of that really big budgeted television here. 
for years, mm. and American companies going, well, I don't know whether we, you know, is this really going to be able to do it? Are you going to have the crews? How much does a grip cost in the UK? What, where are we going to shoot this stuff? Nine months, £233 million worth of new investment in yeah. nine months coming into the UK. Yeah. And, we're now, we're, and we're now developing case studies around that work about how, how the skills base is responding, where the studio space is, what you can do financially. And I think the same, we, we have to keep on doing those things, not just about, well, here's the technology and here's the people that can help you, yeah. but also look what he, she, they have managed to achieve. Mm -hmm. You could do this, you know. Is, I mean, is that a consideration? Because obviously there, there is a, a huge skills legacy at the moment, obviously, in things like the artisan, the set designs, the costume design. This country has an incredibly strong reputation for inward investment projects, but also local projects and the strength and depth in those departments. Do you think as more of these, these larger Hollywood projects come in that builds a skills base for 3D and then does that have ultimately have a residual effect on UK based projects mm -hmm. as well? We very much hope so. I mean one of the things we're talking about quite a lot across um, lots of the sort of creative uh, industries is, uh, you know, uh, we were talking with Adrian just the other day about this, as, um, as the uh, projections, projected levels of production increase over here, mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, lots of the sort of initial go-to people that producers would first off want to employ are going to be busy, mm -hmm. you know, just with the hundreds of millions of pounds worth of extra activity. <laughs> Good problem so, there. you know, it's exactly a great problem, but at the same time, how do we sort of work to build that confidence and yep. make sure we sort of grow the base of go-to people that, yep. that people will employ and that will get greenlit on major production? So one of the things we're looking at is um, mentoring and shadowing programs. You know, so how do you get those top people um, to to sort of share and disseminate their learning and their skills, <laughs> mm -hmm. so that we can sort of um, more rapidly fast track sort of people through the ranks, so we grow the pool of number one, number two, sort of like go-to people across mm -hmm. the different sort of disciplines. Um, but absolutely, I mean, the point is, you know, trying to harness the benefits of this level of inward investment to support the growth and strengthening of the indigenous industry. Yeah. No, I think it, you know, well, and. Dan and I are kind of absolutely charming because this is what we talk about all the time in that mm. sense is that um, it's fantastic to get this volume of work coming in um, but we but the, the, the and the good thing actually about television is, is it and animation is it's less peripatetic it's you know if, if a television series is successful it could be here three to five years so mm. you have an opportunity as you can see very clearly with something like Game of Thrones mm. where they've not only expanded the infrastructure but <laughs> Belfast had a crew, has now got a crew base mm. that it just didn't have five, six years ago. And we're now seeing that applying potentially across the whole of the UK as, as you know, uh, we welcomed a familiarisation trip of animation executives um, just last week. And um, the, the amount of people that are looking for either temp, you know, semi-permanent animation studio bases and then you have things like, I mean you know Pinewood announces its deal with you know the Welsh government just the other day to develop a new television mm -hmm. studio just outside Cardiff mm -hmm. and so you've got you've got this new infrastructure investment expansion at Leaves and uh, did, uh, intended expansion at Pinewood um, and what we need to do is is to make sure we join the dots I've always passionately believed that um, the only reason you know that the reason British filmmakers have access to the extraordinary crews and talent and creative talent that they have is because with the work we all do on investment, we have that infrastructure there. You wouldn't have that infrastructure without the Batmans, the Avengers, you know, um, et cetera, the Hugos being made in the UK. Mm -hmm. So we have to keep that stuff coming in. And what we need to do is, is harvest that mm -hmm. support so that we can precisely do what Dan's suggesting and keep on reinvesting it, grow the crew base, grow the creative talent base, because actually our you know, American cousins who are coming in are desperate to have more British crews, they're desperate to have more British writers, they're desperate to have British directors because frankly it's, it's much more cost effective and easy for them to employ people here mm. than to be flying people over, you know. Um, so there is an opportunity there and, and, and in a sense of what Dan and I do, we're running to, you know, to keep up with that <laughs> and, and, and to help grow that. And we're trying to start as well, much, you know, sort of we've just been working with um, the film schools that we work with as well right. to sort of really look at how do we refresh the curriculum and make sure there's a sort of a base understanding of yeah. these sort of new skills from the very start of people's careers. Mm -hmm. So you know, from the from the outset, you sort of, you, as we were sort of saying, you're not seeing this as a sort of gimmicky thing, but you can really look at the case studies, look yeah. at sort of how people are using this and where it's working from a creative perspective. Um, you know, even uh, at the NFTS, for instance, their their um, their screenwriting students work with some of their games course students, right. so they're sort of working on like games for Oculus 
thrift and sort of right. all kinds of different things. Yeah, so okay. there's a real sort of cross-fertilization yeah. of, of, um, of disciplines and yeah. sort of uh, media. Mm. When we talked about Jean-Pierre Genet, we talked obviously about Vim Vendors as well, and with a bit of insider information, the James Cameron thing that's coming up uh, at, uh, at two today, his, his sort of stance has changed, changed significantly from where he was when he was sort of banging the drum about Avatar originally. And the whole, the general consensus of conversation is the drama uh, is the, uh, well, 3D and drama are an, are an ideal match, and potentially that's where all the eyes are looking. So, you know, from obviously things like Gravity, but we're seeing with, you know, Jean-Pierre Genet and Vim as well. So what, at what stage do we think the British directors that would traditionally do a film for or a BFI funded film will start to sort of make the same sort of leap or, or, or decision toward it, a, a Danny Boyle or a, even a Michael Lear or someone like that. Do you think that's, that's a, a, a matter of time or do you think there's any, any sort of creative drive in the same way of, I mean, Alfonso, despite the Harry Potter in his CV, has been a very independent-minded you know, director for a number of, for of years, obviously, and Vim Benders is, is certainly pushing the, the boat out in Jean-Pierre Genet. I mean, do we, do we see any UK directors of our, what we consider the high echelon of independent directors coming to that conclusion, or is there a, an ideal director that would we imagine, or do we think it's sort of, I guess how do we change the conversation from being a Hollywood-centric thing? Yeah, no, I, I mean, I think it's a very, I mean, it's an interesting question, and I think it is all going to be about, you know, the subject matter and, and cost. I mean, the yeah. thing is about the, the, the directors that you mentioned is that, you know, they tend to work, um, they tend to work on, a, uh, on budgets that are, are smaller than obviously the, than the, uh, the large scale in investment, and I, and I think it's all about the material. Okay. I think I think it's all I think it's all about the material and 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 the opportunity. And I think that I think it, you know I'm I'm absolutely convinced it will happen. And I can't imagine I can't speak for him, but I can't imagine, for example, Danny Ball wouldn't consider it mm -hmm. because he's an extremely ambitious filmmaker. Um, and I, I th you know, so I think that that. Um, th that it isn't something that he would rule out. Mm -hmm. I think he'd just want to actually, you know, have something that he f felt was absolutely fitted to. I think it will happen. I think mm -hmm. it will happen with independent British um, film creative talent. Um, <coughs> I think, you know, but but I think the the, the challenge is the material first and foremost, and, and secondly, I do think it's that scalability. I, mean, I think somebody, somebody, and it will happen. But somebody's want to have to take the risk and say. Well, we can do this at that price yeah. and make it, you know, and it's not a question of, well, we've got to sacrifice that location, that, mm. you know. Um, it, for, for example, I couldn't imagine, you might in five years' time, but I couldn't imagine, for example, Mike Lee doing his latest film in 3D mm -hmm. because, you know, he spent 20 years fighting to get it, I don't know what the budget is, but if, let's say it's 10 million, yeah. you know, to make. Um, his uh, Turner biopic. Yeah. You know, he spent 20 years trying to get the money to do that. Yeah. And probably if somebody said, well, you could do it, but it's going to add another half a million on or another million on at this stage, you'd have gone, oh, no. <laughs> but what about, if it, what about if someone had said you could do it? And because of we know that 3D gets people into the cinemas, and arguably speaking, that's a draw in itself. Would that have changed he, the conversation? Might, I mean, and bear in mind that this is all this is all kind of well, wild no, speculation. But, 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 but he might have done. Yeah. But, but I suspect, as I say, where he was coming from, and and having fought for so long to just get it. Made, well, it's always about the right subject matter. Yeah. That kind of yeah. Um, th then then that's probably why, because independent production ultimately is still in the UK. You know, as we all know, um, is still tough to fund. Mm. You know, completely. But is that? I mean, I guess the, the question is whether, I mean, for me, where the, where the chink in the, in, the, in the chain is. I mean, from to talk to exhibitors who've paid off their 3D systems with Pina and Cave of Forgotten Dreams, yeah. they would bite your hand off for the right subject matter. So they're not talking about putting, I mean, gravity obviously being a bit of a borderline, but they wouldn't put an Iron Man 3 in a, you know, a Curzon no. cinema for obvious reasons. But a well-made, well, the Jean-Pierre Genet's film, for instance, would perfectly fit the fact it's in 3D. Arguably, if I've been completely, you know, sort of objective here, if I would imagine as an exhibitor, is a, is an added bonus yeah. in the sense that it's people won't want to watch it on their iPads, they won't want to watch it on TV, they want to see a Jean-Pierre Genet film in 3D, in in cinema at the earliest possible occasion. Yeah. So, and I imagine filmmakers as well have the same idea if they're inspired, they're, they're, especially if they're independent. I mind it's a British director realizing they're not making a studio film that, that they feel this creatively is what they want to do. Is the problem then in distribution or the confidence in the audience 
at a distribution level, I, or I is, it, is, is it just there's not enough evidence to work out if there's an audience? Dan, what things about this? I, I, I mean, you know, for example, I'm thinking now about you know. What was the last? I mean, it was studio back, but it was the last sort of inde independent kind of uh, sort of science fiction movie I can think of. But if you think about Danny Ball's Sunshine, yes. if Danny Ball was making that at three mils now, mm -hmm. <coughs> he probably would be having that thought. You know, he probably would be thinking. They they would probably be thinking. You know what? Is this going to make a you know? Is this going to make a difference if we put this into three D? And I could see something like that now. Yeah. You know, with what how 3D technology has come up, what is happening, I could see if that was going to be made in Britain again, him going, yeah, actually, that we should do that. Do you think it's because it's a science fiction film we made the connection? I, I, yeah, I, 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 okay. I, suspect, I suspect so, you know, but, but uh, or, or even 28 days later. Okay. You know, because they, they kind of fit. Type world, yeah, yeah. Do, yeah they, they, they absolutely fit. Um, and, and it would be worth, do, you know, doing <coughs> that and investing in that. Um, and I, 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 but I do think that's a, that is a time question. I think it's, a, it's, 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 it's not sort of so much if, it's more like when. I, I, yeah. I, that's what I feel now. I mean, pre-gravity, I, I, actually, I, I, I wasn't sure. Of course. But I kind of looking at that and thinking about what's happened in the last couple of years and gravity being that, you think, mm, yeah, actually, I can see a wider range of filmmakers going, if we can make it affordable and we can build it into the budget, and it helps fulfill my, fulfill my vision, I can see why we do it. I think you sort of need some, I think there needs to be, you know, it's that typical thing when there's one break, what one person takes a punt, you know, yeah. so there's, we almost need to sort of, you know, yeah, get, get, <laughs> get together and almost sort of really back some, you know, yeah. sort of corral someone to sort of have a pilot. And I think, you know, yeah. it's interesting on sort of the VFX uh, side of things more specifically, uh, we, we've been partnering on a, a sort of, um, project sort of uh, an academic industry project sort of looking at uh, the how you sort of explore and um, adapt sort of use of VFX for uh, in particularly low budget <coughs> projects and sort yeah. of make it more accessible to sort of uh, indigenous filmmakers uh, obviously it's it's pervasive but I think you know sort of really looking at how you can find ways of engaging people with it, with mm -hmm. it as well so that people really sort of think about it creatively from the start of the projects um, and I think the same thing in 3D you know we can really sort of get some some opportunities for people to play with this I think yeah. that's the kind of thing that it feels if you've not done it it probably feels a bit daunting and like you know or you see it's largely applied to these huge budget <coughs> productions which can yeah. feel so alien to you yeah. so I think we almost need to sort of find a way to create an environment that people can consider this you know mm -hmm. have an opportunity uh, to get some development funding to explore what the yeah. opportunities could be maybe um, you know talk to some distributors so I think there's probably a, a role from the public sector can play in you know exploring that debate as well more actively yeah I mean yesterday we had two students from the BFI Film Academy um, and the Vivid Echo and so they were they made their first 3D film and they were coming at it from a completely different perspective because I think obviously the largest argument is for these larger scale films and even the sort of the smaller scales as well you've got directors who've been working in one format in a particular sort of way and they've built their career around making a film with this vision in mind and there's a, <coughs> a temptation or a predilection to think that okay well it doesn't matter anymore everything you know no longer exists obviously you know we know that's not the case in many cases but it was interesting yesterday to have the BFI students coming in with no no backstory and just having a love of seeing vision in, in, a, in a different sort of way I mean what's do we see that opportunities for young filmmakers, I guess, coming through, or is it, is it going to be always going to be the first part of their career has to always be in 2D or things, or is it just a time thing? Yeah, but, but I think Dan's right in terms of the, you know the, the part that you're doing in VFX. I think you know we're getting to a stage because you know young people, uh, young film students, think digitally. They don't, you know, they're certainly not thinking photochemically at yeah. all. You yeah, know, yeah. It's, uh, um, you know, that's kind of, you know, it's Stone Age, it's analog. It <laughs> doesn't exist there. Mm. Um, and so if they can if they can do little CGI effects on their editing suites on their Apple Macs, if they can, you know, <laughs> then they've got, you know, if, if they can see, you know, 3D games that they're, you know, accessing, you know, if they, which they are, mm. you know, and when you, when you're, when the things that you're consuming yourself, all the things that you can make yourself mm -hmm. with, um, you know, and, and the fact that, that uh, I mean, Ardman, I think, have got a, a tool for kids that they, a software program that they've developed where, you know, you're five years of age, you can start animating. Mm -hmm. um, and 
that's happening. You know, kids are, are engaging in this. You know, there's obviously there's a program I know that Yuki, the interactive um, trade body, are doing, uh, which is actually partly funded <coughs> by the mayor here, um, which is going to be doing coding programs for schools over over the next six months in London. Um, and there's a whole game shift there where I don't think young people are going to be afraid of these things yeah. or they're going to think, well, if this is the tools at my disposal, yeah. have I got enough resource to get me those tools? I can do it in a lo-fi way myself. Yeah. I'm going to develop out of just doing it on my computer or you know, with my few friends. And how can I access it? So I think, I, I certainly don't think that you know, that kind of future shock mm. is there for those no. young people. I just think they think, if that's a tool that's going to let me tell my story, mm. you know, if it's animation, if it's visual effects, if it's 3D, mm. then I've got to have that. I've yeah. got to be able to access it. And I think that is a, a completely a generational thing. And, and because of that technological convergence mm. between, you know, and the way in which VFX companies, you know, including 3D, think, and in terms of the, the convergence between mm. them and skills and, and, and technology on yeah. mm. games and VFX um, and animation and the way in which they're all going like that mm -hmm. and then you layer that on top with content and when you know we're having conversations now and I was at the BAFTA Games Awards last night and talking to games companies and they they were just, you know, the, the fact that you've got Xbox going, yeah, well, we're going to make a television series of Halo, but actually we want to make another television series which isn't based on one of our games because we want exclusive content yeah. on our platform. Yep. So, you, all of, and then everyone's talking content. They're not saying, you know, it, it, the, the definitions are becoming about <laughs> terminology and length. They're not yep, becoming yep. about technology anymore. Yep. And so I, I, I really fervently believe that, that with all this convergence, and it's happening much quicker mm. yeah. than people, I think, really are aware of, then I think 3D in that context, it's, it, is, it is a kind of, um, it's a knowledge thing, it's, and it's, a, it's, a, it's an age thing, and yeah. people mm -hmm. think, if that's part of the palette I can access, and I can access it and afford it, yeah. I'll do it. Yeah, I think as Adrian says, it's completely generational. To us, it's new and it's different. But if you've grown up and this is what you're seeing, sure. it's it's just what you see. Uh, so I was you know reading the other day about Gareth Edwards, and you just look at him, you know, sort of think Gareth sort yeah. of you know yeah. made monsters for a quarter of a million. Mm -hmm. Now you know Godzilla's coming out, you know, yeah. literally, and then his from a quarter of a million pound film to a sort of like yeah. hundred plus hundred million dollar plus yeah, yeah, yeah. budget is insane. Yeah. And that's someone who just went. I'm just going to do this, yes, you know, and just yeah. sort of he in his bedroom, whatever, you know, sort of, you know, and from his day job, sort of managed to pull <laughs> together the skills to sort of make something phenomenal, yeah. showcase the talent. And I think, you know, that's the thing that at the moment there's kind of there's such rapid change that actually what people are looking for is someone who's got the sort of the nice to just sort of make things happen, yeah. you know, to sort of find ways through these things. So I think that's where we're going to see the real innovation coming, mm -hmm. you know, people who just go, why shouldn't I be able to do that? I want to find a way. And yeah. so that's where we will drive this change. And I think it is the younger generation who just see, as Adrian said, they just see this is just what they, they see and they'll right. find the tool, they'll, if they can't find the tools, they'll try and create the tools to make it happen. Right. I mean, we've got, we've talked about digital and animation projects and then so coming up later today we have a project about pandas and then we're finishing off today with a flight of the butterflies. And both those two things have, have very little visual effects and them all together and especially pandas are shot in an incredibly small budget so they sort of had to come around with from a camera and a location, you know, very difficult conditions shooting in China and that sort of thing. And that again, that's innovation in a slightly different way. But in many ways, the strength of the projects are the subject matters and the choosing it at, at concept stage. So I guess how do we, as well as the focusing the technician side and the actual execution of the 3D, how do, what sort of steps have to be put in place for that genesis of an idea? I mean, forgetting the the sheer scale of gravity and this, all the technology s side of it. I think the, the core concept of space and 3D was already married in people's mind before they got the chance to see that sort of thing and I think people can automatically imagine butterflies in 3D and we can instantly get that and pandas, we can, we can imagine that concept pretty quickly without sort of, over, you know, before we even get to the technology side. Is there, at the earlier stages in terms of directors and producers, at both levels, both at NFTS level and also potentially much further along down the line, to kind of have that conversation as well without thinking of it as a technology or an animation level but thinking of purely as a storytelling or in even further still as a concept level um, and that kind of conversation. I, I'm sure the answer has got to be yes because uh, you know because uh, you mentioned Sky and and uh, and obviously this is stuff that the BBC and BBC Worldwide are doing as yeah. well. Um, 
the fact is that there's a whole natural history story mm -hmm. massively. You yeah. know, we know how popular natural history is. Mm -hmm. You know, flat, <laughs> just technical. You know, natural history. People absolutely, the consumer, mm -hmm. the ordinary public consumer across a really wide age range, <coughs> loves it. Absolutely loves it. And if um, and, and, and with 99% of that material, you're never ever going to be able to go there and see it yourself. Never. Yeah. You know, it's it's you know, it's it's deep in the ocean, yeah. or it's deep in the jungle, or it's deep it's somewhere which is completely inaccessible. And if the 3D experience um, can actually give you a much more visceral engagement mm. with seeing whatever that might be, whether it's landscape or whether it's a particular species or particular habitat or environment, um, then you can just, I mean, that is a vast playground, it seems to me, for, for filmmakers, mm. for documentary filmmakers, for natural history, for wildlife filmmakers. And, and obviously that is just, it seems to me we're just at the tipping point of that, that mm. that's just going to get bigger and bigger and bigger. And going to be much easier because, you know, frankly, the, 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 the kind of audience at home once they haven't got a, you know, because the technology is, is, as we know, is getting there. But whilst you still have to have that kind of angle on your telly, and you, you know, and there's four of you sitting in the living room trying to make sure you're still in the right yeah, 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 yeah. eye line, yep. you know, frankly, it, it's great that Sky has done what it's done, and the BB, you know, sure. has done what it's done within that parameters. But once you take the glasses away, yeah. Um, and I think it's a vast opportunity. Yeah, I, mean, uh, all those, I completely agree. I mean, all those projects as well have had a life as giant screen projects yeah. as well. And I think that's probably very core to their business model, where they've, yeah. they've sort of thought and agreed with this idea that the home entertainment market is relatively small in their entire business plan, thinking, well, this is a subject matter that's going to work well for IMAX as yeah. well. I mean, I think for my, you know, for my, my money, in many ways, 3D plays into this narrative about trying to get people out of the home yeah. and trying to get people into cinemas and yeah. sort of social viewing oh, and cool. these, yes. these kind of things, creating viewing experiences that are very different for anything that can be shown on an iPhone or an iPad kind of thing. Yeah, and I agree. I think, you know, in terms of, as you're sort of saying, in what will be some of the impetus to sort of get some of the um, UK directors mm. who sort of, you know, traditionally work with sort of quite sort of um, <coughs> small scale releases and sort of, uh, you yeah. know, struggling to get screen space. You sort yeah. of go, actually, th if we can, that's why events like today are so great to sort of help people really mm -hmm. understand some of the decision making that went into the choices, yeah. you know, whether someone shot mated or post converted. And, you know, just yesterday in the, um, was in the, uh, the Superman set at the end mm. um, and again just sort of having the narrative around you know how they sort of uh, looked at the sort of the depth they're trying to create in different mm -hmm. shots and sort of what that was adding yep. and da -da. I think it's just really important that people understand all of that kind of the, the sort of the technology behind the sort of creative decisions yes. the creative the technological um, you know, uh, pos options and possibilities, because that will really, I think, start to change the way people think about how they construct narrative. And I think yeah. that's the thing that, at the moment, it just isn't. Uh, you know, although people are developing their own understanding of this, I think we need some sort of more support for people to sort yeah, of I mean, fast track the way people sort of see the opportunities, the potential, and then I think the range of subject matter that people consider doing 3D projects with will, will evolve massively. No, I think Dan's right, and I think it is that, it's that discourse, it's the discourse moving from a, a technological discourse to an aesthetic discourse, yes. and that's why, you know, uh, watching Hugo, uh, even now, you know, watching Hugo, you think, ah, mm -hmm. you know, this is, this, this is enveloping you in that narrative, it's making you care more and engage more about that narrative. Mm -hmm. Because of what they've done, not because you suddenly are being plunged onto a roller coaster ride, even though you have those kind of elements within the, that film. But but it's actually about inclusion and, and and engagement, and that's why they're using that technology in the way they're doing it. And the same obviously applies to gravity and it, but the, the inventors. Film. And I think it's about, and it's also that thing about you know it's interesting about again the, the way in which the people in gravity talk about the the creative artistry about realising the filmmaker's vision. Mm -hmm. It's not like, well, we had these great technology boffins, yeah. you know, who who helped us give a bigger special effect sure. for our buck. Yeah. Um, and I think it is that 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 discourse about, well, how is this <coughs> going to, what does this mean to, to actually, you know, to put the narrative into that context? Yeah. How can that help me do that? Um, and I think that the more... Yes, I think agree with Dan. The more events like this, and the more events with filmmakers actually talking about what the possibilities are, 
then th the more it will change. And that sort of that discourse combined with generational shift, mm. you know, of, of kids coming through who go, yeah, I want to be able to use that. I want to be able to use that, and you know, I don't care how. Let me have it. Um, is what's really going to drive this change, I think. And mm. and, uh, and and I now believe that opportunity exists in a way that it, you know, may not have existed six months ago. Because I think suddenly we were overheating. You know, we were overheating with, with, um, you know, poor post conversion. Mm. You know, on frankly. Let's be honest. Some poor movies, oh, you know, and you have suddenly expensive three hundred million pound movies yeah. that weren't very good, with Should poor post conversion three D. Yeah. You have a kind of complete, you know, oh my god, you know, this is really yeah. killing the fatted calf. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, a, a common conversation and feedback we got on Gravity, especially, was like, oh, I hate three D films, but oh, I quite like Gravity. Yeah. And 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 that's that's twofold, obviously, from a technological point of view and everything. But in as many ways, it also means I don't really fancy Percy Jackson's Sea of Monsters or Iron Man three. You know, this is the thing. If, if at the moment, if the general consensus of 3D is that it's some of temporal blockbusters, then you've you've got a whole audience that potentially are being ignored within the space, and that's not, I feel, a, a victim of the format. That's just ultimately where the decisions are being made about what the actual, you know, what's on offer. Uh, and, and, and I don't think this is, you know, to be honest, I don't think this is, you know, this is an aesthetic conversation. I mean, from my point of view, you know, running the British Film Commission, uh, my job is to make sure that we get as many huge films into this country as possible and we want them to spend yeah. all their money on our visual effects here. Um, but it would be nice if, uh, you know, at the same time, whether they're made here or whether they're not made here, it's not just about 3D, but, you know, there has been examples of, of fil you know, films where it suddenly becomes about the amount of technology, not just 3D, no. but the amount of technology you're throwing on screen. And somewhere in the shuffle, um, the fact that people actually are supposed to care about the characters and the story yeah. gets lost. But isn't that, I mean, isn't that a key part of a bigger conversation which is happening, which is cinema's getting s super extreme because television's getting so good, or the two things happening at the same time. So, I don't know, I'm watching True Detective at the moment, for instance. Fantastic. Yeah. Couldn't possibly imagine that as an hour and a half storyline to get that level of character development. Eight hour film, effectively. No, no, you're right. And television's the complete right format for that kind of thing. So cinemas and movies potentially are thinking that the only way they're going to get people with larger TV screens and home surround systems and things like that is for the biggest, loudest, possible, brightest most extreme kind of thing and that possibly to well, arguably to its detriment 3 ds kind of unfortunately been sucked into that conversation as well that it's only ever been used if like well you can't get 3d at home so we're going to apply it to the biggest possible film you possibly can is that the way the drama i'm not necessarily preferring the only way but is there a way for drama to reclaim its place in cinema in this environment if it's not an effects driven thing but it still has this kind of aspect that at, at 90 minutes you can't replicate it in your home or the same experience well, Maybe. you know, we've had how many years of, you know, cinema have we had now, but yeah. at the end of the day, you know, I still come back to, it's the script dummy, mm. you know, I mean, ultimately, uh, uh, you know, and unfortunately it may not be sometimes, mm. you know, and that's the problem, you know, the, it, it's, it's not beyond the wit of man to make a film that's, you know, witty, funny, engaging with characters you actually care about, <laughs> you know, however many explosions and car chases sure. and action sequences yeah. and we can all think of all those terrific movies going back many many years where you have all of those elements in um, you know whether they were done photochemically or whether they were done with visual t with, 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 with CGI but we still actually cared about the characters and we still actually cared about what happened next yes. and I think that as long as we kind of keep on saying why does yes. that happen next and why do we care about her, you know? And, and as I say, we, you look at Gravity, we end up caring about Sandra yeah. Bullock for the 100 minutes or whatever of, you know, you cared about whether she lived or died. Yes. You know, um, and, and that was why the film worked, yeah. you know, apart from everything else that went on. Um, and there are a lot of films where you think, well, there's a monster bashing another monster or there's a robot bashing another robot. And <laughs> we got two and a half hours and I l and look at that CGI, isn't that yeah. great? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I never heard anybody say they were going to buy a movie ticket because they wanted to look at the CGI. Yes. And I don't think any of our fantastic companies mm -hmm. would say that that's why they're doing it. They're doing it yeah. to make the movie great, yes. you know, and they want to make a, a great movie and they want to be part of making a great movie. That's why Frame Store are incredibly proud of what they yes, do with cool. Gravity and, and all the people involved in it. Um, 
because that's not what they set out to be. They don't set out to say, look, look how great our visual effects were. The movie wasn't very good, but we were great. Yeah, you yeah, know, yeah. That, that isn't the way people think. And, and I think we just have to... It's, it's a very core and very simple <coughs> value. And I don't care how complicated TV characterization. That's always been the strength of television. That's why Dickens' 12-part dramas on the BBC work. Is yeah. you, it's very difficult to compress Dickens to an hour and a half. Mm. But you still can do fantastic drama in 90 minutes. But it's the thing, sort of the way we're marketing films is changing yeah. as well, do you yeah, know what yeah. I mean? That actually sort of, you know, um, that... 3D or not, actually, you know, the the increasing sophistication with which we need to market theatrical releases mm -hmm. is changing rather than just throwing shitloads of money in instead of going, you know, the typical like 50% works, I don't know which 50%. Mm. Let's just actually be more sophisticated, more nuanced, reach out to different communities. It's really interesting with Nymphomaniac, the sort of event, you know, yeah. sort of one night own, the, the yeah. one night stand sort yes. of uh, screening. You know, I think sort of finding different ways. Well, yeah, and that actually, cinema especially. Exactly, well, you know, the Grand Budapest at the moment, sort of yeah. thing. There's, there's so, you know, people love the communal sort of event of yes. going to see a cinema, yes. whatever the kind of context. And I think we just need to find ways to sort of keep engaging people in that. And I don't think it's beyond our abilities to do that. Right. Well, I'm going to throw it open for five minutes of Q&A uh, to the floor while well, we've got Dan and Adrian here in regard to that. Hello. Hi. A bit loud. Um, just quickly, I, unfortunately, I do know some kids who would go and see a film just because of the CGI. But anyway, <laughs> um, outside so of that, you, yeah. Do, yeah, yeah, well, yeah. Um, do you, do you see a future in 3D uh, native acquisition, or is it all going to become post-convergence? Uh, I'll grab that one. Um, I think probably the reality is a hybrid. I would suspect. Um, I think. The, without a doubt, the sort of sophistication of post-conversion has become much more succinct, but mm. there's just something... Gravity, well, gravity, to be fair, was sort of somewhere in between. So there was, you'll hear from... Uh, it's Matt, 2D capture, though. Uh, again, something in between. <laughs> it was effectively, uh, you'll, you'll hear from Matt Bristow coming up, and he was sort of talk about the, um, I guess about 25 minutes of the film was post-converted at Prime Focus. The, the remaining film was, was, uh, was done at uh, Framestore with virtual rigs in a native space. So effectively like a, a virtual native camera treating it. So it was kind of, in many ways, <coughs> native concepts, but because everything was CG anyway. So the, the aspects that weren't post-converted, that were, the, the, if we'd shot those native, would have just been Sandra's face effectively. So it became a bit of, bit of a negative thing. So I mean, I, I, would, I would say in terms of the pure post-conversion projects, if we're thinking of those in terms of it being shot 2D, considered as a 2D film, and then being converted in a different way, gravity was slightly different. But I think that sort of hits the nail on the head of my feeling that what you lose in those, those moments are the interaction of the director seeing the result of the work. So I think probably the reality is a main unit camera, and then this, you know, there's a number of reasons from a scheduling and budgeting reason why this is a constant debate, but the capacity for a director to be able to see the result of the work and for a, of a performance to see that captured makes a lot of sense, whereas VFX plates units and second units, arguably, you gain very little by having those. So I think the, probably the, the in-between measure where everyone would be happy with is something, something in-between. I just wanted to make a little suggestion to one of those things that you mentioned about how to get creatives to think on uh, about using stereo 3D to, to tell their stories. And I, and I did a, a re rather interesting experiment recently on exactly that, because a friend of mine had just finished directing a film, and uh, his name was Giuseppe Tornatore, and the film was the best offer. It was a lovely film. And he said to me, David, what, what on earth should I have done in 3D in that film? So I, I, I wrote a letter to him from the point of view of a stereographer describing to him how every shot would have worked in stereo 3D. In the end, he was quite surprised because he didn't realize that it can be used so much to the dramatic aspects in the story. Uh, that could be a technique, that of uh, uh, telling directors how their film would have looked like if it had been done. Well, he's <laughs> making his next film here, isn't he? So, yeah. Yes, he is. Yes, let's yeah. twist his arm. <laughs> he's, well, he, I've already twisted it, but he, he, I think he's in Edinburgh at the moment doing some uh, location scouting and whatnot. But I know he will certainly do a 3D film in the future. Let's put it that way. <laughs> Maybe not this one.
I think that's it. Yeah, I guess I'll go. We'll just go. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah.